it's very um i hope that i can see your faces so maybe if there is no circum there's no circumstance that doesn't allow you to do it please uh, turn on your camera we already have uh, dr romel kuraming and pak uh, budiawan as well as uh, yuanita wahyu prati uh, with us and we are about we are going to start the um the the first sessions of our e event series with uh, dr romel and uh, my name is Odi, and i will be your um, host for this uh, the next two days and i will i will use these opportunities to uh, welcome you uh, maybe you're from uh, other parts or other corners of, of this country maybe you're from overseas uh, just now dr romel and i uh, just discussed that this is the advantage of having the webinar so we can welcome everyone from everywhere uh, despite of the distance. Um, I will use this opportunity to remind you that, um, of course, this it's already, uh, we are already entering the, almost the second year of the pandemic. So I believe you're familiar with webinars via Zoom, uh, but I once again urge you to always uh, turn on your camera, but uh, keep yourself mute unless you, uh, unless the moderator gives you the floor to um, if you want to have, of course, I also urge you to have uh, words, thoughts, share your thoughts and uh, questions to the speakers. But this is um, based on our my experience and our experience with the Department of History. So this is one of the um, regular agendas of the Department of History. We do have maybe one, two, three events per month could be webinar, could be um, book launch and uh, other other types. Um, and from that uh, frequency, uh, I, I learned that uh, maybe you sh uh, uh, this is a special uh, uh, um, awards. So when the speakers uh, share their screens or present present their presentations, please restrain from you from putting your uh, mouse cursors on the on the on the screen because sometimes deli and, del and deliberately you will scratch something. Jadi untuk bapak dan ibu uh, saya harapkan untuk um, menghindari untuk meletakkan kursor di di di, uh, di atas uh, presentasi ketika Pak uh, Romel dan Pak Budiawan sedang berpresentasi karena seringkali terjadi uh, gerakan kursor itu menimbulkan uh, apa? membuat gambar atau coretan yang yang cukup mengganggu and it's very uh, disruptive dan seringkali pembicara sampai terdiam beberapa detik karena berusaha memproses apa yang terjadi dan apa yang salah dengan presentasi mereka karena ada coretan jadi uh, tolong hati-hati um, karena itu sangat uh, membuat tidak nyaman dan uh, mohon maaf dan mohon maaf jika lebih dari satu kali itu terjadi saya selaku host harus meremove bapak atau ibu dari uh, dari zoom room ini. Jadi uh, demi kelancaran bersama dan supaya bisa materinya bisa sampai selesai dan kemudian kita bisa berdialog. Uh, And in this uh, very afternoon we we uh, I'm not going to introduce you to the speakers but I'm going to introduce you briefly about the moderator. So the moderator is Miss Yuanita Wahyu Pratiwi. Uh, she has just finished her MA, Master of Arts from the Universität Leiden, uh, Institute for History, Universität Leiden, majoring in colonial and global history. But I do believe that she has her research interest is in on the economic uh, history of food, a very uh, unique and particular yet um, interesting uh, research topics. And I believe she did her thesis on the, the rice economy in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, Indonesia. So without further ado, I would, uh, I would pass the floor and screen to Yuan and Yuan, you can uh, uh, take the steer wheel from now. Yuan, please. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mas Odi for the uh, delightful introduction. Um, from now on, I will be the moderator for this session, for this webinar. 
And um, again, I have to uh, welcome uh, everyone for uh, attending uh, this event. Um, so uh, our webinar today uh, entitled uh, Enrique Malaka or Maluku, History and Heritage War between Indonesia and Malaysia. So um, for everyone lived in Indonesia as I am, uh, the dispute between Indonesia and Malaysia is very um, uh, close to us and it rising every time from, from a real fight like uh, Sipadan and Ligitan to a sports game. So uh, this is a really interesting topics. And uh, so we have another fight about Enrique. Is he uh, actually from Malacca or Maluku? But uh, deeper than that, this uh, discussion with Dr. Romul Kuraming and Pabu Diawan will uh, highlight um, what's actually behind the dispute. Why is it there? And what does it mean for, for, for both countries? Uh, already with us are our distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Romul Kuraming. Um, Dr. Romul Kuraming is a, a, a program leader and a senior assistant professor from the uh, University of Brunei Darussalam. Uh, he completed his PhD in Southeast Asian Studies in Australian National University. Uh, and he obtained his MA from, from NUS. And before he joined uh, the University of Brunei Darussalam, he also have completed a postdoctoral in, uh, in the La Trobe University and also in NUS. His topic of interest uh, not far from our topic today, uh, revolves around the politic of non-political as evident in knowledge production and consumption in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And the discussion for today's topic is Dr. Budiawan, my teacher in UGM. He is a teaching uh, staff in, in the history of department, in, in the Department of History and, and the uh, Graduate School of Media and Cultural Studies, uh, Universitas Gajah Mada. Somehow, uh, Pabudiawan and Paromal Kroming cross path at NUS because Pabudiawan also uh, finished his PhD uh, at NUS. And the topic is also not far from, from knowledge production and consumption. It's about uh, immortal, immortalized pa past uh, anti communist discourse and reconciliatory pro politics in post Suharto, Indonesia. So, uh, without further ado, let's just proceed to the webinar. Uh, as the moderator, I'm giving uh, the floor to Paramel Kramin, please, uh, Paramel. Thank you very much, Yuan, for a nice introduction. Um, first, I would like to thank, uh, express my sincere uh, thank to Jurusan Sajara, uh, UGM, for hosting this uh, webinar, for this opportunity to share with you um, this project, I'm going, uh, an ongoing project that I have. So it's an opportunity for me to, um, to test some of my ideas because uh, being away, not being able to go to Indonesia, so I really just relied on what is available online. So I didn't manage to really um, find some, some materials that I, I, I could. So any, anyone who would be able to correct me or, um, yeah, I would be very appreciative to, for, the, for the ideas, the inputs, the the whatever, the comments that you will get. Um, I also like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. So this is a time of the day when um, everyone is already tired, then it's best just to lie down, enjoy the weather. So here in Brunei, it's about to rain. So this is a nice time to really just lie down and watch Netflix. But since you are here with us today, I really appreciate your presence. Okay, so let me share my slides. Okay, so yeah, so this is the title of my talk today. And um, I'd like to start by giving the broad uh, background. How did I end up becoming interested in this? Because this is a kind of interest that only very recently I, I had. Um, so I was invited to a talk on in, in, in consonance with the 500 year anniversary of uh, 
Magellan's voyage. So if we recall, Magellan from 1519 up to 1521 um, had this kind of voyage that eventually circumnavigated the world. And um, so there is this kind of a lot of commemorative activities since 2019 about this event. And one of the things that uh, has been um, revisited in this commemorative activities is the question of who actually was the first cir circumnavigator of the world. And that is uh, where Enrique, um, yeah, Enrique figured it. So who was Enrique? He was known by various names, like Enrique de Malacca, Pangimaawang, Enrique de Cebu, Enrique Maluku, most recently. The first three are old names. The first three are old names. Enrique de Maluku, on the other hand, is it just started 2014. So if you do a search on the internet, I'm going to show some kind of slide towards the end. Yeah, before 2014, Enrique Maluco doesn't exist. So he was uh, a slave by Magellan and it's likely of Malay origin. He was captured or bought in Malacca, possibly in 1511. Um, he accompanied Magellan to his voyages, including the one that um, uh, in search for Maluco. And um, it's interesting that he was um, named, specifically identified in the will, last will and testament by Magellan that was held in 2019. So that signifies that kind of importance he had to Magellan. He was specifically named there and given this kind of, uh, yeah, I'm going to discuss in a bit a while. So he served as an interpreter in this uh, voyage and um, he may be, people, um, actually this idea that he may be the first circumnavigator of the world is not really new. So it, it, it uh, as far as we could say, um, yes, it's early century, early 20th century, this, this idea has already been discussed, but, but very few people really take notice until, until something happened, which I want to discuss in a while. Okay. So there are extremely very limited historical sources concerning, um, concerning uh, Enrique. And um, the first is uh, Pigapeta's account. This is an eyewitness account. It's the most comprehensive and the most authoritative. Um, as a measure of how limited the historical sources are, he was mentioned by name here only once. He was mentioned as a slave only eight times and as interpreter 15 times. In over a thousand days covered by Pegafeta's account, he figured only within 35 days. And only in eight days of those, Enrique um, was heard of. The remaining 27 uh, days, nothing was mentioned of him. So within that 35 period. In other words, only in eight days that he uh, figured in the Picapetas account. And this is already the most detailed. It's, this is already the most comprehensive in so far as, as um, Enrique is concerned. Actually, we can summarize in one sentence what Pigapeta mentioned about Enrique. This is how limited the sources are from the most comprehensive and the most authoritative source. So let me give you a minute to take, uh, to read this. Okay, so that is that is what this is the this is the only things that have um, 
that kind of support coming from Pigapeta. We can add a few more sources to Pigapeta's account, but the, all these sources are no longer um, eyewitness account. These are already, um, or except, except the first one, Magellan's last will in Testament. Yeah, this is a, a, prime, a, re, a real primary source. So in that, in that um, last will in Testament, he, he was named there. He was named as a native of Malacca. And, um, and he was a mulatto. So that description of the word mulatto is um, it's not clear what exactly um, he meant by that. And that will be crucial insofar as the claim that, that uh, Enrique was from Maluku, as I'm going to um, discuss in a while. Another, another source is Hines de Mafra's recollection. Hines de Mafra is also one of the survivors of the expedition. So just, just like to point out that um, the, there was one ship that uh, finally managed to get back to Spain in September of 1522. And only 18 people survived. Um, so only 18 people survived and Hines de Mafra was one of those. So he's, um, he's, he's an eyewitness account as well, but because he, it came out, it seems to be, he, he seems to have a, um, um, over, a dec over a decade, uh, more than two decades later. So this eyewitness account is, is really, is, is something that is, um, a, a lot of questions is raised in this. But in so far as Enrique is concerned, only, only one passage about Enrique was mentioned in this. And that has to do with Enrique being or getting drunk. So, so another, another, um, another source is a very important one. So far as our discussion today, this is Maximilianus Transylvanus Molusis Insules. So this, um, this, this is, um, this came from the interviews with the survivors. It is important because it stated specifically that Enrique was from Maluku. It's um, also important because this, this is, is actually a form of letter to a high-ranking church official. And um, in this letter, he described, he, he reconstructed what happened in the, in the expedition based on the interviews with the survivors. So it, it came out quite quickly, just a few months after the interviews were done. It, it came out the following year, 1523, and it, it, it circulated widely in Europe. It, it shaped the way how Europeans had, um, had uh, understood the expedition even more than Pigapeta. Pigapeta's account would come later and it would circulate in a smaller circle. And um, not until 1800, when Pigapeta's account, a more complete account would come out. So in the span of 200 years, more than 200 years, uh, much of the information about the, the um, much of the understanding of Magellan's expedition came from this, came from this uh, um, letter. So another, another is the Martin Fernandez de Navarretes. It's a compendium of um, accounts of different voyages. And um, in this, in this, um, this is a four volume. And in this, um, Account, you see Enrique being listed among those who died in the massacre of May 1, 1521. So I'm going to say a bit more in a while about that. And, and he also mentioned that Enrique was from Maluku. So Maximiliano Transylvanus and Martin Fernandez de Barrete, these are, these are the two um, bases for the claim that uh, Enrique Maluku, Enrique was really from Maluku. And finally, is Francisco Lopez de Gomara's La Historia de la 
Las Indias. And it is um, uh, yeah, so in this particular account, Enrique was mentioned to have been presented to the advisors of the King of Spain on this day as part of effort to convince the king to support the uh, expedition. So these are the additional, okay? These are the additional um, sources. And if we take a look at this, we can revise the one sentence summary to look like this, if we take on board all those additions. So yeah, I'd, li I'd like to give you time to read this. Okay, so if we're going to compare this summary to the last one, not much really has changed here. The main difference has to do with the origin. There are no more, there are now um, more possibilities here. It's not just Sumatra that uh, was mentioned by Picapeta, but Malaka and Maluku as well. And the mention of being a mulatto. By mulatto, it means hybrid. And there are instances when the being hybrid, a uh, mix of black and white may be taken as being dark. So that, that is where the idea, the, the name Henry the Black came from, okay? Henry the Black or Enrique el Negro. So, so you see, how little it is has changed this kind of summary is a testament to the fact that um, those additional um, sources really didn't change that much, okay, the idea. And we can see here how limited the sources are. Despite these very limited sources, fully developed life stories of Enrique that span from 1490s to 1560s were written. And you can see, would be amazed of how complete these life stories are with fiance, son, itinerary of travel from this place to that place on that particular year, that place, the impressive skills, loyalty to Islam, even graveyard. So that just to mention a few, complete with all these kind of details. But if you if you're if you're going to go back to that summary, that's the only statements we can make that are based on historical sources. And uh, as we can see, 500 years later, Enrique lives a heroic, accomplished, and colorful life in three countries, Malaysia, Philippines, and recently, Indonesia. So how did it start? In Malaysia, okay, in Malaysia, a novel was written called Panglima Awa that was uh, published in 1958. And this novel was written by a well-known nationalist writer, Harun Aminur Rashid. Harun Aminur Rashid was a Malay who was based in Singapore. And he got the idea of writing this novel from, but when he read in Straight Times, this article, the first man to sail around the world was a Malay. So this appeared in 1955. There was another article. Um, there was another um, newspaper article that he had read. I'm going to mention that in a while. And these two articles gave him the idea. And he wrote the novel. So it's a very imaginative biographical um, novel. It's corrective to colonial and feudal interpretation of history. So it's a very, it imposes that kind of nationalist um, interpretation of um, <clears throat> nationalist interpretation on the, on, on, on Enrique. So he was given this kind of uh, yeah, exemplary warrior. He was very loyal. He was very brave, was patriotic. So all this kind of hyper 
um, yeah, those kind of descriptions, superlative descriptions. And um, he was captured, the story of his capture, became close to Magellan and his family, he joined the voyage. And towards the end, he returned to Tanamalayu, he reunited with his fiance, and fought against the Portuguese, continued that kind of struggle. So that, in a nutshell, was the novel was about. Now, um, if you bear in mind, if you bear in mind that the that the that the historical sources could be summarized in one sentence, you would be amazed at how imaginative he was. But this novel proved to be a lasting. Um, contribution or lasting legacies. It, was, it became so well received in, in, in Malaysia. It became even a required reading in schools, became a basis for examinations on the uh, <clears throat> major examinations. And um, so the success of this novel um, was um, manifested in the fact that just two years later, he came up with a sequel. So anak pang awang. So that kind of imagination that yeah he even had yeah he and his fiance eventually got married in the, in the last book, and then he finally they they had a, a son and the 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 son continued the struggle against the foreigners. So that kind of idea, and you would see how much the impact of these two novels, as as indicated for example in a, in an article in Berita Harian. So yeah, that kind of extraordinary impact, uh, lingering impact of the novels up to now. So this novel shaped the way how Malaysians understood Banglima Awa. And if you take a look at how um, netizens, so people are using um, those debating online, you would see that they, they, they took the novel as some kind of history, so as if he actually did this, did that. He was actually like that, like that. So those kind of things, and they would really fight tooth and nail for, for their belief that uh, Panglima Awang was like this and like that. All of those information really came from the novel. Now, the impact of the novel can be seen by the fact that even scholars in Malaysia now, they have really, they're really doing this kind of uh, research, for example, that they're trying to find the possible um, graveyard of Panglima Awang. So they're tracing it in Rimbao, for example. These are really serious um, effort by scholars. And even this, they make this kind of claim that, um, yeah, the first compass was done, was made by Panglima Awang. So all those kind of yeah, he was a skillful sailor, excellent warriors, all of those kind of things. And you would see how seriously the Malaysians are taking, um, taking this. And um, I'm emphasizing this because um, this is the, the backdrop against which we will try to understand what, will, what could possibly happen when um, a claim coming from Indonesia that uh, Enrique was actually from Maluku how will this be received in Malaysia once they get to know about this? So there, the dispute over Enrique started uh, when, when somebody from the Philippines, a popular historian called Carlos Quirino, he made this kind of claim that Enrique was actually from Cebu, in the island of Cebu, in Karkar, Cebu. And um, the basic reasoning he had is if, if Enrique could understand the language of the natives during the time, then he must have originated from there. And he came up with all these kind of claims. Enrique was captured at the age of 10 or 12. So those, those kind of details, so this slavery in Malacca, so all those kind of things that, uh, as we know, based on the one sentence summary, there's really no basis for that, but just the same, uh, yeah, so just the same, it, just like in Malaysia, it, the story um, takes life of its own. And it was, a novel was written about it. 
a uh, novel written by famous uh, writer was um, inspired by it. Several Filipino persons called Believe Him. Up to now, even um, books that were published by, by foreigners, yeah, took him, took his story, his story as some kind of history. And the uh, documentary is being made only about to be completed in 2021. Took, yeah, 35 years to make, inspired by this kind of idea. So you would see how, how the impact is. So up to 2014, only Malaysia and the Philippines were involved in the dispute over national ownership of Enrique. This change in the turning point when the book Enrique Maluku was published and uh, Helmi Yaya and Reinhard Tan was, Tawas was, were the, the authors. And they based this kind of claim on Maximilianus Transylvanus, that he was from Maluku. And also one of the key keystone in their in their argument is uh, yeah that he's he he is black. He was called uh, yeah Henry the Black, and this this Henry the Black came from the idea that he was a mulatto, and they claim they thought that Sumatrans, Filipinos, and Malays cannot be as dark as Orang Maluku. So yeah, that provided that kind of details, key dates. Just like, uh, for example, uh, um, Kerino in the Philippines, he provided all these kind of key dates. And um, much of this really are not, uh, they have no basis in the historical documents. Okay, so actually, yeah, this one thing that uh, um, actually, it's also very early in Indonesia when this claim was made. That was done in 1956, published in Waspada. It's a Medan-based newspaper. This article um, claimed that, yeah, the first circumnavigator of the world is an Indonesian. But no one in Indonesia pursued this claim further. And um, that makes me wonder why Sumatran seem disinterested in this kind of question. And um, the, the kind of uh, assertion made was from coming from Indonesia is Enrique came from Maluku. Helmi Yaya, for example, is from Sumatra. And I asked him, uh, I, I asked him some questions by a, a messenger on Facebook, but he didn't uh, reply. Okay, so now there, there's, when I read the book, there were, there were certain passages in the book that made me realize that this book was written against the backdrop of the ongoing heritage war. And these are the passages that I, I, I saw. Yeah, I'm giving you a minute to read this. Okay, so other than this, other than these passages, there was a chapter in the book that um, reprinted the short article written probably by uh, Reinhardt uh, to, uh, that was published in Reader's Forum of Jakarta Post sometime in 2010. So that article was the first um, article and that talk about this possibility and they developed this further to form the book. So from 2010, 2014, yeah, we know that, uh, yeah, I'm going to say something more about the heritage war in a while. So we know that, uh, yeah, if we recall, there is this kind of incident, 2007, um, about the Raza Sayang. And um, it, was already, uh, it was already a very contentious affair. But what happened in 2009, 2010 was even worse. Sparked violent protests, even threats of invasion. So you can see, for example, in the screen, 
all these kind of insults that uh, Malaysians and Indonesians traded. So all these kind of yeah, uh, shocking insults were traded during the time that, that demonstrate the intensity of emotions that went with it. Um, we, we know that this is a part of a long-standing tension between the two countries. We know about the territorial disputes, the logical conflict going back to Sukarno, for example. So the confrontasi, for instance, the memory of confrontasis. We know about the environmental issues coming from the haze and all these kind of disputes and labor that has to do with um, TKI in, in, in Malaysia. So, so the sports, all this kind of, whenever there's this kind of uh, football or any sports competition between the two, you can see that kind of tension. So this is part of the entire um, thing. Um, so I, that made me wonder, okay, so the basic, the basic idea in the paper that I wrote about this is the basic question that I was trying to answer is, is the history war over Enrique another chapter in, and will it expand or intensify the heritage war between Indonesia and Malaysia? So that's the main idea in the paper that I wrote that I'm sharing you today. So how was the book received in Indonesia? Um, it seemed totally new to the Indonesian public. As it's, a lot of people were surprised about the claim. I can see in the posts uh, on, on YouTube, on comments on YouTube, as well as in, in um, Facebook, for example. So this is a mix of skepticism, surprise. Uh, and uh, some people, yeah, that kind of sense of pride. Um, particularly coming from Mulukans themselves. They were saying, oh, is that true? Okay, so yeah, finally, there's something, uh, something uh, positive to talk about, about us, according, I, I, according to the Mulukans that I, 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 I saw on the YouTube. Because uh, he was so tired, he said, uh, being identified as uh, a preman, as a collector, debt collector. So at least somebody like... Uh, uh, yeah, the first circumnavigator of the world is somebody who came from Maluku. So that kind of uh, response. Now, um, from August 2014 to 2015, it generated uh, hype in the social and conventional media. Um, we can say, for example, if you take a look at the Google Trends, um, during this period, during this period, During this period, you see it reached the maximum of 100. It could actually could be higher than 100 because it, it, um, if you don't pay, the Google Trends would set that kind of limit. So you can see here, and during this time, yeah, that kind of uh, a lot of, uh, before this, you see all flat, all the way, no, nothing about Enrique Maluco. It's, it's on that particular period, soon after the publication of the book, that um, these kind of searches were done. So from mid 2015 to 2018, there is a lull in interest. For example, you cannot see any posts on Facebook or in YouTube about this. So the initial, initial reaction was quite good, particularly in, in, in uh, Twitter, for example. But after that, um, soon after, yeah, um, it, it died off. And um, this internet, yeah, you, you see different uh, newspapers, provincial as well as national, covering it. Even National Geographic uh, covered, said something about it. So that happened during this time. The, after that, that would be uh, quiet until 2019. You'd see that kind of renewed and apparently more sustained interest in Enrique Maluco. So. This kind of lull from 2015 or up to 2000, uh, early 2019, um, yeah, Malaysians, for example, there's, you, can, you cannot see this kind of uh, uh, conflict online over this. This would start sometime in 2019. So 2019, you can see something like, yeah, all these kind of samples of what we can see, uh, comments on YouTube, as well as in um, Facebook, for example. So you would see here that uh, the, the, what happened 
in 2009-2010 uh, was being relieved to a certain degree. Um, <clears throat> those kind of things, the clashes online since 2019 are still uh, limited in scale and frequency. But they may be uh, signs of what to come. So um, there are occasional very intense exchanges that they are insult uh, in Malaysians, Indonesians are really locked in uh, that kind of uh, fierce exchange of uh, insults. Um, but they're still very limited as of now. And but but despite that kind of limited scale and limited frequency, we can easily see how easily how easy to provoke each, either of the two sides. So if you take a look at what happened 30 years before, so between Filipinos and Malaysians disputing the national origin of Enrique, nothing happened that came close to, the, to what has been happening between Malaysia and Indonesia. So this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, dialogue or debates, some uh, the, once in a while, there are some kind of um, some kind of uh, <clears throat> bad words being said, but uh, not really to the extent that they would each they they would insult each other. But in the case of um, what we can see from 2019 between Malaysians and Indonesians online about this is altogether yeah way way much uh, more heated already. It's all, it's only three years now. Up, up, up to this point, uh, still very limited number of uh, Indonesians are aware of this kind of claim. And uh, I think this will just, um, yeah, there is a plan, for example, to have a documentary or a film on Enrique Maluku and the support coming from certain groups, particularly, for example, Governor of Maluku and other people. You would see here that um, it's just a matter of time that more and more Indonesians will get to know about Enrique Maluku. And um, there is this kind of feeling and sense uh, reading posts online that um, things are being hidden from them. So why is it, for example, one, one newspaper said, what took them so long? What, why it took more than 400 years, 500 years in order for something like this to come out? So who is hiding this kind of uh, truth from us? Something like that. And um, she, so um, it's... Likely, in my view, that um, yeah, it it, it uh, this this kind of history war over Enrique will will form a more persistent or lasting picture of the broader conflict on heritage and other areas between Malaysia and Indonesia. Thank you very much for um, joining me. That's all for today. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ramal Kroming, for the uh, broad explanation about Enrique and the disputes uh, surrounding him. Uh, and after this, uh, we will uh, invite uh, Pabudiawan to uh, comments on on your uh, presentations, on your research. Um, Pabudiawan, uh, are you with? Us yet? Yes. Oh yeah, please. Uh, the floor is yours, Paudion. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yuanita. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Firstly, I would like to thank the Department of History for inviting me to be the discussion of this forum. It is a pleasure for me to learn about the issue of Enrique de Malaka slash Maluku, an issue which I really never heard about before OT contacted me for this forum on last December the 2nd. Really? <laughs> if Romel writes that the name of Enrique Maluku was virtually unknown in Indonesia before 2014, 
the name of this historical figure did not get into my mind before December the 2nd. So, how ignorant I had been, but I'm sure I was not alone. This is something which Rommel is concerned with as well. So, we should thank to Rommel for his scholarly attempt not only to raise but also to problematize this issue and to frame it within the heritage war between Indonesia and Malaysia. It is a pleasure for me as well to meet again with Romel, although just virtually. He used to be my colleague when we pursued our graduate studies at NUS around 20 years ago. When the last time we met was around five years ago in 2016 in the Revisiting Malaya Second Forum held in the campus of Gajah Mada University. From Romel's presentation, we learned that the ownership of Enrique as an historical figure living more than 500 years ago, more than a half millennium, has been contested among the three countries in the region, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Romel mentions a little about the conflict of ownership of this historical figure between the Philippines and Malaysia. Mentions a little or hardly mentions, yeah. but it does not mention at all whether there is a dispute of ownership between Indonesia and the Philippines. But I'm sure there is none, since there was no historical proximity between the two countries. And so far, Indonesia has hardly any conflict with the Philippines. Rather, Romero focuses on the conflict of the ownership of this historical figure between Indonesia and Malaysia. Coincidentally, in the current AFF Suzuki Cup, which is going on in Singapore, the Philippines belongs to the different group from Indonesia and Malaysia, whereas Indonesia and Malaysia have to compete each other in the group stage. <laughs> and Romel put it within the Heritage War framework. Romel has indeed addressed this framework proportionally. He mentions about the conflict of ownership on Pate, Song of Rasa Sayangi, Gamelan, and Angklung, food, in this case, rendang, nasi goreng, satay, kris, wayang kulit, etc. This all happened in the years after 2002, the year when Indonesia lost. I put the term lost between inverted commas, the islands of Sibadan and Ligitan, located in the northeast coast of Kalimantan, in the International Court Justice. I have mentioned uh, lost between inverted commas because, in fact, according to some experts on international maritime law. When the case appeared in 1969, the dispute over Sipadan and Likitan, both Indonesia and Malaysia did not have any clue on who had real sovereignty over those islands. As I have written in one article, such conflicts of cultural heritage come down when Joko Widodo became the president in 1914, in 2014, because the Indonesian people put a trust on him to solve any conflicting issues with Malaysia due to his resolute leadership, unlike his predecessor. It's very sorry for the supporter of SPJ, if any. Putting the issue of Enrique within such a heritage war framework is okay. However, it is not enough. Yes, those disputes over cultural heritage were triggered by the case of Sipadan Likitan, by which 
a sense that the national dignity of Indonesian has been subordinated by Malaysia is commonly found among the populace. Therefore, in dealing with any conflicting issues in the Indonesia-Malaysia relation afterwards, the public have tended to be so sensitive that offer reactions are often inevitable. What I would like to say here is that such a heritage war was uh, is traceable to the era of confrontasi. I think uh, Romel has mentioned it before. Yeah, but yeah, um, such a heritage war is traceable to the era of confrontasi, which formally lasted from sixty three to sixty six, and it's popular memory among the Indonesian afterwards. I think that historical event and its traces in the popular memory, which has made Indonesia, Malaysia, between inverted commas, trapped in the love hit relations. I think uh, a significant number of scholars, both Indonesian and Malaysian, have uh, argued that Indonesia Malaysia relations uh, are in a love hit relationships or uneasy relation. As I have written in one article, on the Indonesian side, one of the main factors that has made the relationship of the two neighbors uneasy is the memory of confrontasi embodied among the people. It is indicated in the use of Crush Malaysia or Ganyang Malaysia rhetoric whenever a, ma a mass rally expressing anti Malaysia sentiment breaks out. That rhetoric was indeed very popular when the Indonesian government, under the leadership of Sukarno, launched the campaign against the formation of the Federation of Malaysia in 1963. During the Suharto era, the discourse of confrontasi was constructed in the tone of seeing Sukarno's campaign against Malaysia as a disguise of the hard internal economic crisis by then. However, what people remember about this historical period is significantly different. On the Malaysian side, what has made the relations between the two nations sometimes uneasy is the common stereotype that Indonesians are troublemakers. This stereotype is likely created by the national narrative of the confrontasi episode that sees it as Sukarno's, as the representation of Indonesians' expansionist ambition in the region, as is written in the Malaysian history school textbooks. Ah, I'm suggesting that Rommel should take such an historical background of the heritage war into account. I mean, such an historical background and its popular memory into account. Another thing which I'm suggesting that Rommel should put into consideration is the nature of the platform of social media itself. As we know that accessing into the social media in particular and into the internet in general is directed by the logics of algorithm. Once we get into certain accounts or websites or channels, we will be directed into similar ones. So that on the net, we only meet netizens having common ideas or perceptions with us. There are relatively few netizens having opposing ideas. This means that virtual space is like an echo chamber. It is a space amplifying our voices without hardly encounter with the different or opposing ones. By considering these two things, I think Romel does not necessarily come to a conclusion or a sort of prediction that could make us, the Indonesians, feel worried about this historical warfare. Now, one correction before I'm closing my comments. 
the name of Maluku governor is Said Asaga, not Said Al Saga. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Babudiwan, for your comments. Uh, now we have already listened to the uh, main speaker, to Baromal Kuraming, uh, about the uh, uh, issue of Enrique Malaka in Maluku, about uh, the hard uh, sources that we actually have from that period when when he lived with, with Magellan, and then uh, about uh, the products that was made uh, from that, but uh, then contained so much uh, information that was not uh, actually based on uh, that uh, primary sources. And we also have uh, learned about how this uh, issue developed in, uh, in Malaysia, in the Philippines, and also in Indonesia. And uh, particularly from from uh, for for the case of Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, uh, this uh, became uh, one more episode of heritage war because uh, Indonesia and Malaysia always have this uh, uneasy relationship. And uh, Pabudiawan, uh, in addition, um, um, explaining more about uh, why uh, there is this. Uh, uh, love hate relationship between Indonesia and Malaysia, and Pabudio and invite us to uh, look at the historical context, look, look at the historical backgrounds that uh, uh, provoke certain events. Like, for example, uh, between Indonesia and Malaysia, the uh, hateful comments, the uh, uneasy relationship became uh, more and more evident after Indonesia lost in the uh, fight over uh, Sipadan and Ligitan. And for both countries, Indonesia and Malaysia, this uh, uneasy relationship uh, again uh, brought us to the uh, episode of uh, confrontation in, uh, in the 60s, uh, in the Sukarno era, when uh, yeah, all of those uh, slogan like Ganyang Malaysia firstly uh, originated. So um, now, uh, we will invite a uh, free uh, questioner to first uh, involved in our discussions. So I'm opening uh, the chance for three uh, questioners. And then uh, if we still have time, we will uh, open uh, more uh, chance. So um, for the three questioners, um, I think, uh, you can uh, raise your hands or put your question in the chat. Uh, please, uh, I'm giving the uh, opportunity. Uh, okay, we have uh, one in the chat from from. Mahir, uh, uh, please, uh, must you can uh, unmute yourself and just directly uh, state your question. Hello. Hello. Can I speak? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh ya, apakah konflik apakah konflik Malaysia Indonesia berpengaruh terhadap sudut pandang negara Enrique atau Panglima Awang? Okay, yeah, thank you for your question. Indeed, it shapes the way how they wish to interpret um, uh, Panglima Awang or Enrique Enrique Maduku Malaka. That that um, for for <clears throat> Many Indonesians uh, who believe that um, Enrique was from Maluku, no amount of uh, counter evidence or counter argument will make them believe otherwise. The same thing with Malaysians. So they, they're, um, 
whatever they believe in, um, even if you present, even if you tell them, for example, that uh, it's it's really not certain that uh, Enrique was from Malaca. He was called Enrique de Malaca because that was the usual from the historical uh, development of history. It became just used as a name. It doesn't necessarily follow that he came from Malaca. But even if you provide those kind of evidences that that point to that possibility, they won't they won't believe you because they're so used to the the idea that they they yeah what they what they know they they wouldn't budge they wouldn't agree with uh, any of those kind of counter arguments particularly if this comes from Indonesians if this kind of counter argument comes from Indonesians in other words this kind of conflict the way affect the way how they interpret the how they view um the the how they interpret uh, panglima awang or or indike malaka maluku so that that their own national um interest comes first okay so yeah any other question okay uh, may i ask the question yeah yeah please uh please sorry. So uh, I'm sorry I'm not joined for the first time, but uh, I uh, is it possible uh, Hendrik de Malacca from Bugis? Is it possible because I heard that uh, maybe Hendrik de Malacca uh, from the Bugis? I just want to know: is it possible? Oh, um, okay. So we cannot rule out the possibility that uh, Enrique um, uh, is from any particular place like Bugis or wherever. Um, what we can say is that based on available evidence, this is what is being said. So if there is this kind of possibility that he, he, he might have been Bugis, um, I, I would like, I, I would love to see the possible, um, that kind of possible evidence. And uh, I, I, I am open to all the possibilities because I, I, am, I myself don't, don't uh, all these kind of historical evidences, they are only, uh, there's no way really we can verify exactly um, for truth because we cannot go back to the past when, when it happened. So, that's a possibility, but it's not really an absolute thing. So, yeah. I have a scan about the, the, the face of the Hendrik de Malaka, you know? Maybe I can send you. Oh, that, that's please, 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 please give me your number. I, I will send you the, the, the portrait of the Hendrik de Malaka. Oh, okay. So, it's, oh, that's you, Reinhardt. Yeah, thank you very much for joining. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you I can much. send you as soon as possible. <laughs> oh yeah, sir. I will. I will <laughs> give you my email. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you, Paramal, Pabudiawan, Juanita, Odi, uh, Francine, uh, Kajamada. I am the co-writer of the book, Enrique. You, you are right. You mentioned the name Enrique Maluku was beginning to be popular in 2014, of course. That was when the book was published. And you know, it was officiated. It was launched in January in Ambon by the governor, Pak Budiawan Manson, as a graph, the governor at that time. And none other than, you know, Pak Anis Baswedan. He was the minister of education and culture at the time. So Helmi Yahya and I spent two days with him and the governor for the launch of, launching of this book. And earlier you mentioned, uh, Paromel, that uh, the first in Indonesia claim appeared in Jakarta Post, yes, at Reader's Forum. I wrote the letter to, to Jakarta Post, which they published at the Reader's Forum. The reason I sent it there because I want this information to have an international appeal in English. Okay, so uh, 
uh, I followed this from beginning. Uh, thank you very much. You know, you have uh, explained everything. And it's basically, we have the same sources, of course. But then if we talk about where is he from? Okay. It's simple. Maximilianus Transilvanus interviewed the 70 people, not 18. Why? Because Pigafia Feta was not included. Okay. He interviewed the first, I say the first 17 survivor. Okay. Because there are but two. If you go further in the book Los Fiajes by uh, the Martin Fernandez de Navarrete, you'll find that Victoria, the ship, when they returned to Spain, was intercepted by the Portuguese in Caferde. Actually, there are 30 people in the ship, three being the original crews, uh, the uh, 27 original crews, and three Ambonis. They took with them three Ambonis to take care of the spices in the, in the ship. Okay, 10 people was detained by the Portuguese, only released two weeks later, written to Sanlucar de Barabeda. And Maxi, Maxi uh, Milianus Transilvanus being the secretary to the Holy Roman Empire, you know, at that time, the king of Castilla, Spain, is Carlos I. At the same time, he is also the king of Holy Roman Empire, Carlos V. And he had the secretary, Maximilianus Transilvanus. He had the privilege to interview the 17 survivors. All those 17 survivors said, Enrique was from Maluka. Why? Because they have, they have arrived in Maluka. They have reached Maluka. They have seen Malukans. Maybe before that, they are not sure that Enrique was from Maluka. Once they see the Malukans, they return to Spain and they tell the secretary to the Holy Roman Empire that Enrique was Malukans. And it was, you know, uh, this kind of things claim depends also on the sources. Uh, thank you, you have quoted all the sources that needed. But then for Malaysia, they quoted only Pigafetta. They don't want to see or they pretend not to see Maximilianus Transivanus the Molucis Insulis, okay? Because the book mentioned that Enrique was from Maluka, from the Maluka, okay? And the most but, important but thing I have, sorry, is- uh, uh, I think I will uh, give you one more minute because we still have a okay. uh, few more, more questioner. Yeah. Yes. And uh, there are two historians who also wrote about the origin of uh, Enrique. You mentioned that, the Gomara, and there is another one, the Oviedo. Their subject of uh, sources also are the same as Maximilianus, the survivors. The difference is Maximilianus only 17, these two, Gomara and the Oviedo, 27, including the second batch who returned to Sanlucar Baramuda two weeks after the original one. Thank you, Yonita. Back to you. Thank yeah, uh, you, Bahrain Heart. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank please, you Baron, much. if you have uh, more comments towards uh, oh, okay. what had been said by Bahrain Heart. Okay, yeah. So the, the, um, <clears throat> the, the one, one thing that we, in, in historical methodology, when, because it's, in historical methodology, there's this kind of hierarchy of sources. Yes. And um, the most uh, preferred are those, the first hand, the first hand sources. And it yes. just so happened that uh, oral sources like history is often uh, ranked um, lower than the written ones. And um, if we go by that kind of hierarchy, we, it, it's um, Pigafetta's account that will be on top of uh, everyone because it's the it's the re it's the only one that is eyewitness, and um, 
that's that's the first hand kind of thing another is so pigapeta mentioned from pigapeta's point of view um uh, it's it's sumatra he came from sumatra and i wonder it's really one thing that you probably anyone who can help me understand here if if indonesia would like to really take a, a claim over ownership ownership of enrique it it's it's that he's from sumatra is the the best way how to do it because even harun amin rashid who wrote the novel admitted that he is from sumatra so <laughs> that that is that is the and and besides uh, pigapeta's account is the most uh, uh, it's likely that he talked to enrique in the longest period while they're on the ship it's likely that he 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 made the list of words the malay words there with enrique's help so he must have had a lot of interaction with enrique they go together on several these occasions that we can see uh, they were being sent to discuss with uh, the the local chieftain for example so among those people there it is pigafetta who has the most likely the the weightiest kind of uh, authority to claim where he might have come from now uh uh magellan's last will in testament because it is a document publicly official document that also carries a lot of weight from the standpoint of other historians and that is the basis of uh, malaysia's claim they they would tell you that it's stated there that he is a native of malacca so what else you are going to to complain about but in ma, ma, i have some doubts that even if it is indicated that he was from a native of malacca it doesn't necessarily follow that magellan actually knew where he came from there is that kind of possibility now maximilianus transylvanus um the having relied on the interviews and from these people the survivors that that, that that probably ranks third among the if we go if we go by the strict historical methods yeah <laughs> but i don't discount the possibility as you see a historical methodology is an open method present an evidence and we will see how how it will weigh against other evidences so yeah but all these kind of things <laughs> at the end of the day um um uh, in the day to day life of people what they believe in is what they like to believe in so even if we historians present them evidence people in malaysia or in maluku they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, yeah pay attention to us because that feel that makes them feel good <laughs> but then to answer your question if we have uh, to sorry so much sorry pa i think uh, sorry we have to to cut you because we we have a really limited time and still have a oh, question okay. in the chat uh, waiting for us uh so yeah uh, we have uh two more questions in the chat from bu susana and bu indah utami um yeah, oh, uh, yeah i think okay yeah you um hey. you could uh, directly uh, could you directly answer it uh, roma okay thank you you and Okay, so there is a question. It's a very interesting question. Um, either if would it be possible to make a distinction between elites' way of seeing and people's understanding of the past? That's a very interesting uh, question, if, particularly in so far as as this uh, as this case is concerned. Yeah, as I was saying earlier, um, people will believe in. something that will make them feel good about themselves so that regardless of evidences we presented yeah they they wouldn't budge so it, this kind of elite and the common people standpoint we historians probably represent the elite here okay from the historian standpoint what matters is what can be proven by historical evidences Okay, so that's that's what 
matters. But from the standpoint of people on the ground, it's what, they, what makes them feel good about themselves that really matters. So this idea of, um, yeah, that, brings, that, that reminds me of uh, Lauren Berland's idea of true feeling. So in her mind, the, the idea of true feeling is very interesting. In her mind, this idea of true feeling is that truth is not based on evidences. Truth is based on what, is, what you feel to be true. So the basis of truth is not, it's not logic, it's not rationality, it's not evidence, but the, the, the feeling. And from, from a common people's standpoint, and, and this applies to this case as well, yeah, people, they would believe what they, what they feel good about themselves, they, and regardless of evidences. Okay, so another question. I'm wondering why did people in Malaysia, the Philippines and Indonesia, made such claim of Enrique? What was the motivation? Was it to challenge the Eurocentric narrative? What is the implication of this battle of playing over this figure to the study of history, heritage, and that? That's also a very excellent uh, question. It, it really, um, yeah, it, it all boils down to national pride. When uh, this idea that Enrique might have been the first circumnavigator of the world. So you see that kind of, we're, we're still operating on the, the nationalist frame here. So anything that will make our nation um, stand um, as tall or taller than others, we will grab them. And it's Enrique's, um, the possibility that he might have been the first circumnavigator of the world, that, that, that's it. So what was the motivation? Shall... Okay, challenge the Eurocentric narrative as well. That is also another important element here because that idea that for, for so long, the world knows that the first certain navigate of the world, the title is given to Magellan or Elcano. Okay, so uh, Elcano and Magellan were reputed to be the first certain navigators of the world. And a claim like this, that it may be a Malay or a native from Southeast Asia is the one who did it. So that sparks, that triggers, again, that kind of tendency to be uh, wary of uh, the dominance of Eurocentric um, tendencies, specifically uh, in relation to history writing. Okay, so what is the implication of this battle over the play of the the study of history, heritage, and memory. Actually, it, it, this is a fascinating case to look into um, Enrique's claim. The, this, the, the case of Enrique and the battle over him by three countries, it's a multifaceted uh, case that tells us so much about, uh, about the nature of history, about what heritage is, what constitutes heritage, I actually uh, have written a paper, I drafted a paper um, where I, I uh, look into the philosophical, historical philosophical aspect, philosophy of history aspect of this case. And I, I, I make use of the um, Michael Oxshots and, um, and Hayden White's idea of practical past and historical past. So I make Practical past is the past that is important for, for us today, for people, for common people. Historical past, on the other hand, is the kind of history that historians, professional historians do. So by, by looking at this case from the philosophical standpoint, you will be able to point out a lot of very fascinating uh, uh, insights on the nature of history. Why is it, why is there a dominance, for example, why does professional histo history dominates over others? Whereas, whereas the popular history or those kind of practical history, that is exactly the kind of history that most people need. That is the kind of history that is useful for common people. So it, it connects to the question earlier about the elite and the, the people's view of history. So we, we historians normally look down on popular history, 
we normally look down on uh, yeah this kind of this the, the history based on different mediums like novels for instance but in this case we can easily see in panglima awang the novel the panglima awang the novel is the hegemonic hegemonic um, um, medium in malaysia so it, it, i i i started i i took a look at the book that is written about panglima awang uh, written by really very 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 good historians and i compared their their book with the novel and you would see um because the novel is so much more this is the by some kind of bible in malaysia about panglima awang people will refer not to the scholarly uh discussion but they refer to the novel as if the novel is the history so uh this attitude that we have towards popular mediums popular history is 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 a reflection of our 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 historians our own uh, tendency to look up to ourselves as the superior ones so but if we take a look at the notion of practical past and historical past these are just two different ways of perceiving the past not neither of these two is necessarily superior than others so you would see that kind of ontological uh, balance or ontological uh, distinctiveness attributed to this kind of history professional history history that we do as phds is that it doesn't necessarily mean that is the superior kind of history it depends on who will use and will decide what what history is okay so another question yeah I, I thank you very much for that question it's a very very excellent questions another question um uh, the topic about love hate between indonesia and malaysia according to your last chapter in your book can you share share your views about this topic in political identity context political identity yeah i'm very fascinated I am very fascinated uh, observing how the conflict, this has long-standing conflict between Malaysia and Indonesia, has been ongoing. Um, it's like uh, it's like uh, watching uh, close uh, families fighting against uh, each other. Sometimes it's the the worst fight happens within our own family. And as we know, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia are close kins. They share so much historical, political, cultural. So that kind of shared elements between the two is enormous. And um, if we're going to be rational about it, we might as well look for the things that uh, are shared rather than those things that uh, make them separate. And those things that make them separate normally are things that are rather recent or shallow in origin the things that they share are much deeper much deeper they shared history culture traditions for so for centuries and um, if we ought to look for the shallow the sources of conflict then that reflects on us the one who see it the one who prefers the shallow over the deep and that speaks that be speaks to indeed a lot about um the the struggle of both malaysians and and indonesians in their sense of identity as a person as individual as a group and as a nation so what is it in them that makes them easily offended by certain kind of comment okay it's it doesn't have anything to do with what actually malaysia or indonesia is but it all boils down to what is in each of them deep inside that that makes them offended when something was said about this country or another country so it, it really boils down to identity politics Okay, another question. Um, oh, okay, that's the same. That's the same thing. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Pak Romel Kroming. So um, now, uh, Pak Budiawan, if you have uh, some more to be added to Pak Romel's comments on these questions, please. Uh. Okay, thank you, Yuanita. Uh, uh, I'm not giving a comment on Romel's uh, responses to the questions of the audience, but I would like to say to the audience that uh, even if Rommel addresses the historical debates uh, over the historical fact of Enrique, it doesn't mean that he involves himself in the debate. Is it right, yeah, Rommel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't involve yourself in the debate over the historical fact of Enrique. What Romel is concerned is um, the debates, the claims, the war of claims over the past of Enrique among the three regions, especially among the three countries, especially between Indonesia and Malaysia, without positioning himself to judge which claim is historically truthful. What is concerned is uh, in what context such a claim comes up to surface. What is the meaning of um, the conflict? Uh, and uh, how is the dynamics of the conflict? So uh, as you mentioned that there are two kinds of history, like uh, scholarly history, or what he terms uh, elite history, uh, and the popular history, or I would like prefer uh, use the term popular narrative of the past. Yeah. Um, and historians, professional historians, tend to what underestimate the popular narrative of the past. Yeah. As methodologically, it is not in line with the uh, scholarly methodology as uh, done by the professional historians. Um, and I think what Rommel is done is something which is new, I think, in the field of the past narrative studies among the Indonesian scholars. Yeah. Um, in fact, several years ago, I was teaching in the Department of History, the history and the politics of memory. Methodologically speaking, that is uh, precisely the same as Rommel has done. Concerning with the popular narrative of the past, yeah, without judging um, the historical truth of that narrative, but searching for the meaning. Yeah, what do people imagine when they construct such a narrative, and why they imagine that way, and what conditions, uh, what kind of context which have conditioned them imagine that way? And how is the dynamics of such an imagination? Is it right, Romel? Very, exactly. You put it much better yeah. than I did. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank okay. You. Okay, thank you, Yuanita. <laughs> okay, so, because it seems that some audience uh, have kind of uh, perceived that you are a historian who involves yourself um, in the historical debate, so that asking which historical claim is historically truthful. No, that is not uh, your position, right? Yeah, yeah that's okay. right. It's not, it's not about um, accuracy. It's not about accuracy. It's what is meaningful for people. So because we normally have this idea among, as imposed by uh, scholars, by academics, that what matters is accuracy. In reality, for most people, that's not what is important. 
that is important only for the educated class, uh, particularly for scholars, because that affirms their superiority. That affirms, and that is what the what my book is actually about. Tomorrow, I'm going to discuss my book, and that's precisely what this. Uh, yeah, it connects well with uh, my talk tomorrow, uh, because uh, you see, um, it's the um, if you begin to see that uh, the, the intellectual standpoint is, is not necessarily the superior standpoint, but uh, uh, it's just one of the possibilities, you, we will begin to see things differently. Because the problem among scholars is we're, we're too consumed with this belief that the intellectualist standpoint is the best standpoint. So we, we inherited that idea from the Enlightenment project all the way going back two centuries ago. But uh, it doesn't really necessarily follow for most people. And that's the reason why populism is increasing in different parts of the world and they are exerting all this kind of pressures to us. And, and, and the tendency among intellectuals is to regard those populist instincts, populist moves as irrational, as stupid. So all these kind of negative views, but we have to understand that these this impulses have been suppressed for so long by the dominance of the intellectualist standpoint as manifest in the supremacy of science in historical methods. So unless we come down from our ivory tower, and unless we come down from the, the up tower there, we will not be able to understand reality on the ground. But we claim that we wish to understand reality. And much of reality is reality involving more people, those people on the ground. Reality is, is there. And unless we, yeah, we shed of that kind of... Uh, intellectualist bias, we will not be able to really understand them. So that is the thing I'm going to discuss tomorrow. And it connects well with the questions that um, yeah, we discussed today. Thank you very much, um, Budiawan. Yeah. I'm going to email you about your, your comments, uh, uh, particularly about the algorithm. Okay? So because I am fascinated by what you said about that. So what's the implication of that in so far as uh, how analysis, how analysis should go in so far as the use of the social media? So I'm going to email you about that, okay? Thank you very much for pointing out. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, pa Romel Kuramang and Pak Budiawan for the, um, I think a very wonderful closing remarks already. So, uh, unfortunately, we have to close this webinar because the time is up and and it's almost the end of the day so everybody must have to do something else to yeah. rest themselves we can so uh, as, we can well, sorry, yeah That's sure uh, after this we will we will uh, take pictures together so um yeah just to to highlight some point that uh, at this webinar we've learned more uh, about about truth than about Enrique itself uh, because uh, yeah, truth is uh, uh, determined by, by many factors. And uh, um, I think uh, it's very interesting that uh, what's true for a person is actually what they want to believe. And uh, the debate in a scholarly realm that, that, that considered to be superior up to this time is actually not superior to, to, to a popular uh, narrative. And and also, yeah, um, this uh, this research is not to to involve in a debate about uh, where did Enrique came from, but uh, to see the debate, uh, to capture and to study it. Uh, um, yeah, so that's that's from me. Uh, I think uh, I will um, return the floor to Mas Odi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Yuan, uh, uh, Dr. Rommel, and Pak Budiawan. As Yuan said, it's already the end of, or end of the day, so I'm going to make it very brief. First, I think uh, 
we should take pictures zoom style so you can uh, turn on your cameras smiling and i will count uh, i will do the countdown and then uh, wait then and, and my colleague ruhan will take it for us are you ready okay three okay wait until everyone uh, put the cameras on i will let Okay, I think some of you have turned on your camera. Okay, three, two, one. Once again, now with uh, Bahasa. Satu, dua, tiga. Yes. Ruhan asked for another one. <laughs> uh, okay, so now we I'll, I'll count from one in English. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again for everyone who has, has have been actively yeah. participating. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pak Budiawan. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rommel. We have also hey. Pak Rain Reinhardt thank, here. Thank you for resurfacing Enrique Enrique's for us. Uh, as Pak Budiawan mentioned, that maybe some of us never heard of the names uh, until recent until very recently. But um, of course, it, the, your publications contribute uh, so much in uh, in introducing these figures, um, with um, of course the motivations that you have written, both in the Jakarta Post and as well as in your book. Uh, I've uh, seen that some some questions touch upon the historiographies and the Philippines. Wait, and you can keep it for until tomorrow because tomorrow. Uh, uh, morning, 10 a.m. Indonesian time, we will have another uh, round with Dr. Rommel, but for tomorrow, the discussion will be um, Professor Bambang Purwanto, who is um, a guru of Indonesian historiography himself. So I, I believe you don't want to miss this uh, the book launch. I have distributed the books, uh, the book to, to all of you that, that are registered in the, in the webinars. We're going to talk about the um, the um, the nation, the state-sponsored historiographies, and how the states uh, and uh, how this the relations between the states and the intellectuals. So I hope I will see this all of you uh, tomorrow, 10 a.m. Uh, sharp. Uh, but we will open the Zoom room um, 10 to 15 minutes before the session starts. Once again, thank you. Selamat sore and selamat uh, melanjutkan. Mm.